a lot of people nowadays are they're building gigs with a CNC machine or a plasma cutter and they're putting out hundreds of gigs a day they're all identical you can't tell them apart they're cookie cutters they're good gigs there's nothing wrong with them but you can't you can't work them you can't use them the way that you use these in my opinion in my younger days it was a subsistence lifestyle you know you a lot of things you had to have ration stamps to get and you just had to make it the best way you could off the land we'd go out and pick berries blackberries mom and can them crab apples grapes plums we walked the woods for anything that was edible and mom would big gardens mom would can them and put them away the river come into play when we uh, started gigging the river in a what they called the old wooden john boat 24 feet long i remember daddy saying just as clearly as it was yesterday shine the light over here son i think i see one you take a step over towards him. Creeks weren't wide, you know, and shine light and he'd gig it. Maybe your cousin or a buddy on the other side say, shine light over here. You step over there. But then I got to uh, do my share of the gigging too. At a very, very early age, ever since I can remember, we hunted, fished, and trapped. Uh, well, I've been interested in gigging all my life. Uh, it's a disappearing art. So the more people that know how to make them, the less likely it is to disappear, period. And in 95, after I collected for a while, I thought, well, how did they make these? What process went into this? And that's when I searched out Paul Martin. They told me where he lived and who made a gig that I found in Van Buren. And so I drove to Bunker to yeah, talk to him. And later he contacted the Missouri Folk Art Program and uh, he apprenticed me and uh, he was a master and taught me for six months how to, how to make uh, gigs. It, it's hard to learn. There's so darn many different steps. I mean, it's not just like going out there in 10 minutes whacking out a gig. If you're pretty good, you can make one in a day. But you better be pretty good to make one in a day. This gives me an opportunity to do things that I didn't have 20 plus years ago. And doing it with you is just as much an honor as doing it with my grandpa. I hope you understand how much it really does mean to me. Paul Martin was uh, Anthony's grandpa. I met Anthony when uh, uh, at his grandpa's. He's eight or nine year old then. And uh, he was a youngster, but he really showed uh, uh, interest. Don't need much. You got it under that. Grandpa was, he was old, older and his health wasn't real great whenever I got to, uh, got to realizing that, it, you know, hey, I needed to learn this stuff. And so uh, by the time that actually came around, he, he'd stopped making gigs. As uh, Anthony grew uh, into more manhood, he, uh, the interest stayed with him. He come down to see me and I said, he want to learn some things. And I said, hey, if you want to really learn, we'll uh, see if the Missouri Folk Art Program will uh, sponsor us, you know. two guys working together, master apprentice, is really a lot better. Tom Cannon Blacksmith Shop is just a block down south of the courthouse and museum. They like for people to 
come down and, and watch the, uh, the work that's being done down there. It's, it's like going back in time. It's, it's kind of a thrill, really, to imagine people making do and getting by with what they had. Luckily, I've been able to show Anthony uh, two or three tricks and uh, as I've used them, kind of inventions I've come up with myself and he's adapted them and uh, uh, he'll, as he goes along, he'll come up with new ideas of his own. So it's an ever learning process. And hopefully if we're drawn next year, then I can teach Paul Martin's grandson. That'll kind of make it go full circle. But Paul Martin taught me. I taught Paul Martin's grandson. So I think it'll be a great story. My name is Rachel Hastings, and these are my Ozarks. <laughs>